describes the beauty of sound. Think of a poem, which I'll come to later, the nightingale, Ode to a Nightingale, where he says, I cannot see, but I can smell, and therefore I know which flower is blooming where. Think of the beautiful flowers that you know, my dear students. Maybe not the flowers that Keith saw in England, but think of the flowers that you know. Shut your eyes and try to imagine the Mogra or the Rajini Ganda or the Ratki Rani or the Madhu Malti. I'm talking of flowers that we find in Gujarat and therefore all of you will immediately be able to understand the kind of smells that I'm talking about. Shut your eyes and imagine what Keats must have felt when in the middle of the night he says he's wandering and he does not know which flowers they are because he cannot see. Because it is dark, remember, he cannot see, but yet he can smell by the fragrance and therefore smell becomes equally important. The song of the nightingale and therefore these ear, the ear or hearing becomes important. Think of touching, think of feeling, think of the tactile, you know, satin-like quality of the flower. So that is equally important and taste when he talks of the blushful hypocrite, when he talks of the, the wine that is brought from the warm south. Remember, he's thinking of Italy. He's thinking of Europe, where some parts of the Mediterranean coast are certainly warmer than the kind of cold weather that Keats is used to in England. So he talks about, and some of his lines are so beautiful, when he talks about bubbles winking at the brim, Think of a bottle of any drink, not wine, but any drink, my dear students. And think of how you have bubbles, any drink with a little fizz, and you see the bubbles. You see the bubbles coming, and you see the bubbles disappearing. But to the great poet Keats, they were bubbles winking at the brim. What a beautiful picture of a very ordinary sight. This is the kind of sensuousness that we see again and again in the poetry of Keats. No wonder we call him a great poet. The next quality, which is characteristic of all of Keats's poetry, is his ability for imagery. Slide, please. The lyrical quality is combined with the imagery, the metaphors and similes, and the symbolism. They all come together. We must read some of the longer poems. We must look at poems like Endymion, and poems like Hyperion maybe, in order to understand. Because along with this, I would like you to know a word, Hellenism. Maybe some of you have come across the word. Probably the word medievalism, when we think of a poem like the Eve of St. Agnes. And of course, a word like Hellenism. The Greek influence, right? Helen, double L, H-E-L-L-E-N-I-S-M. Not to be confused with Helen of Troy, though she is an important character when we think of the Iliad. But when we talk of Hellenism, we are talking of the influence of Greek art and sculpture on Keats. More of it when we discuss the Grecian urn in detail. Ma'am, if I may interrupt Yes, here. Namita. Uh, don't you think that sometimes Keats, Keats as well as all the Romantics are difficult to understand because of the Greek references? the mythological references. Uh, yes, you are absolutely right, Namita. But I think in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in England, mm -hmm. the period that we are talking about, right, the Romantic Age, mm -hmm. I think people did not even consider Europe, you know, European art and alien literature to them. alien to them. That's you know, right. it's like saying, uh, it's like saying, shall I say a Hindi word, but we have the same word in Sanskrit, yes. you know. Because, because their origins are. So when we think of England mm -hmm. and English literature in particular, mm -hmm. let's remember that it's only the 14th, 15th century. Chaucer, mm -hmm. Geoffrey Chaucer, right? We call him the father of English literature. So English literature, when Keats was writing, mm -hmm. is about 400 years old. Right. And if I can put it a little, uh, you know, a little vaguely, not so clearly, how old is Greek literature? How old? You know, we have to go back to Homer. How old is Roman literature? We have to go back to Virgil. So we are going back about 18 plus to about 2000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we are tracing a culture, mm -hmm. a literature, mm -hmm. maybe an inspiration, maybe a source, which is 2000 years old. To you and me, mm -hmm. and to most of us in the 21st century, trying to understand Keats's poetry, mm -hmm. 
uh, which is influenced by Hellenism mm -hmm. or medievalism or Greek art and culture. I wholeheartedly agree with you mm -hmm. that it's going to be a tough proposition. Right. But when Keats was writing, mm -hmm. I don't think it was so difficult. And it, I guess it was widely read at the time. Absolutely. Widely used and widely read. Absolutely. You know, the Elgin marbles, for example. You know, you That's go to true. a museum, mm -hmm. you see something, and you imagine that everybody would be able to relate. Agreed. I mean, I mean, think of, uh, think of, think of what? Think of Lothar. Or think of Dola Vira, yes, right? So when we think of Gujarat and we think of these places, they are so much a part of our ancient civilization that we would not even ask, what are we talking about? Indus Valley? Yes. Of course it's ours. Mm -hmm. Of course we know what it is about. You know, to Keats it was something like that. Definitely. And that is why this 200 years, you know, after which we are reading Keats, maybe to some of us it may seem difficult. But I think, Namita, for our students, as well, for, as, well as for us, I think a little more reading would make all, all poetry, yes. right, all literature more interesting. So my dear students, do read about Keats. Do read about the Elgin marbles. Do read about Greek art and literature. Not only because it will get you more marks, but also because it will help you to appreciate what is the, you know, what is the basis, what is the source. That's true. All what is all literature for that matter, but certainly Keats. Because, uh, Namita, I'm sure you'd agree with me that Keats was um, greatly influenced and inspired by Spencer. Right. Spencer, the great Elizabethan poet. Yes. Having lived so many years ago, mm -hmm. writing, but uh, Keats even sort of experimented with the uh, Spencerian stanza, mm -hmm. you know, which after the Elizabethan, all through the next 200 years, no one did it. No, more than 200, 300 years, nobody did it. Mm -hmm. And then again, Shakespeare, I'm sorry, Keats was trying to imitate what was written in the Elizabethan age. Since we're talking of the Elizabethan age, I think it'll be interesting to tell our students, Namita, also that uh, each age has a special, uh, shall I say, form of poetry. Definitely. When we think of the Elizabethans, we think of sonnets. Yes, yes. When you think of Browning, you know, later, after yes. the Romantic, the Victorian, you immediately think of the dramatic, dramatic monologue, monologue, right? right. So right. with uh, Keats, you know, there are certain kinds of poetry, mm -hmm. certain forms, literary mm -hmm. forms, which the sonnet and the ode, mm -hmm. of course, right, being the most important. Uh, another area which is often neglected uh, by us, by us, I mean by teachers and by students and research scholars also probably, uh, with reference to Keats, I think is Namita, the letters of Keats. You yes. know, if you want a running commentary, mm. right, if you want a, want a running commentary of the poems of Keats, you should see the letters that he wrote. You know, then you'd immediately come to know what influenced him, what inspired him, what was his particular experience at that moment. I was staying with this person when I listened to a nightingale. Yes. I saw a nest of a nightingale. You know, when Keats writes this, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's beautiful. I think we should look at that also in order to be able to. So maybe we could take it to our classroom. Why not? Yes, and tell our students more about the... Uh, uh, all this is what contributes to the greatness of the odes. Definitely. And let's talk about the odes. Imagine most of the odes, uh, Namita, were written in the period of uh, a year, a little more than a year. Mm -hmm. Generally, people talk of 1819 yes. you know, as being the year in which most of the odes were written. His greatest poems, because remember, Endymion got bad reviews. Hyperion was a fragment because no publisher wanted to take the risk of publishing another long poem by Keats. Of course, you have poems like Isabella or The Pot of Basil, inspired by etc. But most of these poems are not read generally by even those of us who love romantic literature. They are read only if they are prescribed, probably, right, in a particular class or course. Can I have the next slide, please? Let us very quickly look at the odes. Ode on indolence, a difficult word, but all of us love to be indolent, I think. Ode to psyche, my dear students, the word psychology, right, should give you some idea of what psyche is about. Ode to a nightingale, ode on a Grecian on. Ode to Melancholy and Ode to Autumn. I have not really put them in the order in which they were written, but I've put them in some sort of an order because you might like to link up some of these uh, odes, my dear students. You know, they have something in common with each other. Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, I'm interrupting here. No, welcome. Uh, isn't the uh, 
ode to a nightingale, a companion piece to ode on a Grecian urn? Mm. I think you're absolutely right. Because on one, it's the world of nature. Right. And when Keats talks about dying, mm -hmm. you might very well. Any student might ask us, but the nightingale would die too. Mm -hmm. But remember, the nightingale continues to live on because we are not talking of a specific nightingale. Right. Right. And then when you look at the Grecian urn, we move into the world of art. Art. Keats was greatly influenced by the Greek art that he saw. You know, there used to be exhibitions, yes. uh, wandering exhibitions, and he saw the um, he saw a lot of Greek art. Mm -hmm. Of course, he travelled too, and when he looked at this, he found uh, that art stays on and on and on. Right? Art is eternal. Right. Life is transient. Mm -hmm. To imagine that one ode is talking about nature. Mm -hmm. And one ode is talking about art, art, and yet they are, you know, they have to be read together. Because, um, Namita, if you look at these odes, I think you would agree with me that these are his best odes. Definitely. All his odes are good, but even among them, these two odes are the best, best. odes. Uh, we'll talk about them in detail because Definitely. I think we must discuss them in and detail. Both them are frozen in time, just as the figures on the urn Absolutely. are frozen in time. So the nightingale, thanks to Keats, Keats is frozen in time. Uh, isn't it interesting that we have such beautiful bird songs, if you can call them that, yes. right? Bird songs, the, the, the color of that we talk about, my dear students. It's, it's such a beautiful word, the color of, you know, mm -hmm. the Gujarati word color of, I think really conveys the chirping, the twittering, mm -hmm. the singing of birds. Mm -hmm. And the birds like the nightingale and the skylark. I'm yeah. thinking of two writers, mm -hmm. uh, contemporaries, romantic poets, one writing on the nightingale and one writing on the skylark. skylark. Not to forget other people who have written. Remember the cuckoo, mm -hmm. to the cuckoo by Wordsworth. Mm -hmm. Think of nightingales by Robert Bridges. Right. You know, you've got poems and poems and poems. We can call them bird songs. What is an ode, my dear students? You do remember that we have looked at different kinds of literary forms. And one of the forms is poetry. And then when you think of poetry, you think of different kinds of poetry. And then you talk of the lyric as a form. And then when you talk of the lyric as a form, you talk of the ode, the sonnet, the song, the idyll, the elegy. I'm sure somewhere along the line, in your first year, second year, or third year, each one of you, has heard of the ode as a literary form. What are the chief characteristics of the ode? I'm sure you would recollect that an ode is always a direct address. Remember the figure of speech apostrophe, my dear students? A direct address. Whether it is Shelley singing, bird though thou never wert, O blight spirit, he says, right? How does Keats address the Grecian urn? Try and recollect. He calls it a bride, right? He calls it a foster child. He calls it a sylvan historian. All these words are direct address because in an ode, it is always the poet who is directly talking. It could be to a person. It could be to a thing. It could be to a quality. It could be to a creature. But there is always a direct address. What are some of the features of the odes of Keats? There is a contemplation of beauty. There is a love of nature. There is a power of imagination. I think in order to look at these three qualities, my dear students, I think we should once read a few lines. I'm going to read, as I said, from two of the best known odes. Let me begin by reading from Ode to a Nightingale. And remember, when I was talking about sensuousness, those features of his poetry that I talked about, I want to read that verse to you, my dear students. If you have your books with you, look at those lines. And if you don't, please do go back home and look at Ode to a Nightingale, verse number five. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet 
wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket and the fruit tree wild. And then the flowers, my dear students, which we don't know, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. Such beauty, such subjectivity, such love of nature, such power of imagination is one of the characteristics. When I talk about subjectivity with reference to the odes of Keats, I cannot but read a verse which describes the sorrow that Keats felt. Why did he want to fly away with the nightingale? Because the world here, the mortal world, the world of sorrow, the world of passion, the world where everything is transient is so painful that the only joy that is possible is in flying away with a nightingale. And therefore, he says, I'm reading verse 3 of Ode to a Nightingale. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves has never known. And what is it that he knows and the nightingale does not know, my dear students? The weariness, the fever, and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan. Where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond.